lucid dreams are when you know that you're dreaming while you're asleep. You're aware that the events and scenario that you find yourself in may be surreal or irrational, but at the same time, the dream feels vivid and you feel fully conscious and aware, therefore able to control your own dream actions and in some cases, your dream surroundings. That said, there are altered states which resemble a lucid dream where one is conscious and in control but lacks the ability to alter the actions of other people in the dream, indicating it may be something other than a dream. While a dream is a figment of one's own subconscious mind, if there's a consensus reality where we're interacting with other consciousnesses independent from ourselves, then it's not just a dream, but another plane of existence. Some call this the astral plane. There are techniques in which we can train ourselves to wake up inside of our dreams, effectively inducing a lucid dream state, meaning we become aware that we're dreaming, and then collapsing the dream, meaning the projections from our subconscious fall away, leaving us in the underlying reality without the dream narrative. One of the authors that wrote on this subject was Carlos Castaneda, an anthropologist born in Peru whose writings helped usher in the New Age movement in the 60s, starting with a series of books that describe his training in shamanism, particularly with the group whose lineage allegedly is descended from the Toltecs. In one of his books called The Art of Dreaming, he takes the reader on a journey of the soul based on six years of meditation, where he reveals that there are worlds existing within our own that can be visited through dreams. According to Castaneda, there are seven gates of dreaming, or obstacles to awareness, which when overcome, yield total awareness. He discusses four of the gates in his book. The first gate is about stabilization, which is achieved by focusing on something, such as your hands, in a dream. One should then shift focus on something else, then return focus to the hands, repeating this several times. The second gate is arrived at when objects in a dream start changing into something else. This level is crossed when one is able to fall asleep without losing consciousness. It also refers to the activity of dreaming together with other practitioners. The third gate is often known as an out-of-body experience, when one can control the dreaming body in the physical realm and move around at ease. The fourth gate consists of being able to share the intended dream reality of other people. One has to have gathered enough strength into the dreaming body through the previous gates in order to travel to other people's dreams. Having sold more than 12 million copies in 17 languages, his critics suggest that they are works of fiction. But he's not alone in his theories regarding altered dream states that extend beyond an exclusively subjective experience. Dream telepathy, as the name suggests, is the ability to consciously or unconsciously communicate with fellow humans while sleeping and in a dream state. This concept of dream telepathy is not a new one. Over the years, many famous scientists have tried to understand this mysterious phenomenon, such as Sigmund Freud, who attempted to understand the implications of dream telepathy on psychoanalytical thought. On multiple occasions, he accepted the influence of telepathic ideas on the human thought process. Carl Jung believed in the telepathic hypothesis without question and even developed a theoretical system to explain paranormal events of this nature. It was none other than Nikola Tesla who once said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all of the previous centuries of its existence. According to Dr. Stanley Crickner, professor of psychology at Saybrook University in California, a wealth of anecdotal and clinical material exists 
which supports the possibility of telepathic effects occurring in dreams. However, an experimental approach to the topic did not become available until the psycho-psychological laboratory technology became available. It was discovered that sleeping research participants awakened from periods of rapid eye movement activity were frequently able to recall dream episodes. As a result, it was possible to request a telepathic receiver to attempt dreaming about a target stimulus that was being focused on at a distant location from the telepathic sender. In the mid-1960s, Monique Ullman began a series of experiments to test if humans could be made to dream selectively about randomly picked material. In other words, they could choose what they wanted to dream about before going to sleep, and this could include anything from artwork to movies to photographs and more. Soon after these experiments began, people all across the world began to take interest, and the experiments required that the sender and receiver who were made to meet just before sleep were then made to sleep in separate rooms so the telepathic sender had an envelope waiting for them in the room in which they slept and it would contain something like a picture or a drawing and the receivers were then purposely awakened shortly after their REM or rapid eye movement sleep began so the researchers could take a dream report and these experiments continued for more than 10 years and they yielded significant results. There is in fact some level of dream telepathy even among total strangers. Although we're still not able to articulate how and why the telepathy works, there's convincing evidence that the phenomena exist. The study of quantum physics has shed light on the vast interconnectedness of everything in the universe. So one possible explanation is quantum entanglement. For example, Consider two electrons that are created together. If you send one to the other side of the universe, the other will allegedly respond instantly, regardless of their distance from each other. This is one way of interpreting how everything is really connected in some way. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. So, with the growing understanding of subjects like quantum physics, we've discovered that there are vast, interconnections between almost everything or all matter in the known universe but we're still not able to understand exactly how two minds or seemingly separate consciousnesses are somehow connected in dreams where reality seems to occupy another dimension or one that is different from the reality of the waking world yet shares a quantum interconnection. The topic of quantum entanglement is at the heart of the disparity between classical and quantum physics, and the subject has progressed considerably since 1935, when Albert Einstein first published on the subject, where he argued that the description of physical reality provided by quantum mechanics is incomplete. Later, however, the counterintuitive predictions of quantum mechanics were verified in later tests where long-distance communication between objects exceeded the speed of light, which, according to some interpretations, demonstrates an instantaneous effect regardless of spatial distance. Of course, there's other forms of testing which is not made public because they involve elements of consciousness that certain intelligence agencies of the U.S. government prefer to keep secret from the public. It's well established that the nationalist socialist German government of the 30s and 40s did extensive research into the occult, allegedly acquiring advanced propulsion from paranormal means, such as through the use of mediums like Maria Orsic, who was a member of the Vril Society, a Germanic secret society that conducted research into metaphysics and a universal energy called Vril which was described as an all-permeating etheric fluid which could be harnessed for spiritual purposes as well as space travel.
claims have been made that the same technology that is responsible for anti-gravitic flight as demonstrated by what were known as Foo Fighters during World War II and UFOs since then is also able to manipulate space-time itself, essentially merging physical science with the consciousness science Nikola Tesla was referring to. In 1983, the CIA wrote an obscure classified report looking into the gateway experience, claiming that an altered state of human consciousness may be able to transcend space and time. Decades later, the document has since been declassified and made available online through the Freedom of Information Act. The CIA researched achieving higher levels of consciousness and interdimensional travel, which was based on work by Robert Monroe, a pioneer in binaural beat technology, which he called hemisync, which many people have claimed to have had success with in inducing out-of-body experiences and astral travel. Ancient cultures were aware of how the brain could be entrained through sound repetition and how consistent rhythmic sound had extremely powerful healing and spiritual benefits, aiding in the achievement of a trance-like state of consciousness. Through the use of repetitive drumming and chanting, Tibetan monks, Native American shamans, Hindu healers, and master yogis have been able to induce specific brainwave states for transcending consciousness, healing, and concentration and other spiritual growth. Scientists have conducted research on the drum beats used during rituals of ancient cultures and found that they generally beat at a steady rate of 4.5 beats per second. This consistent beat induces a trance-like state for the entire tribe due to the brain shifting into a 4.5 beats per second brainwave frequency, which is a low theta brainwave state. The way binaural beats work was first described in 1839 by Prussian physicist and meteorologist named Heinrich Wilhelm Dove. The word binaural means having or relating to two ears, and the process works by simultaneously sending a marginally different sound frequency into each ear, usually through headphones. All right, we'll be careful on the electrodes now. At the Monroe Institute in Virginia, yeah. Carol Sabic is preparing for a flight beyond her body. We need to hook these wires up to the amplifier here. Okay, does that feel comfortable for you like that? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. She's being launched by consciousness researcher Skip Atwater. Okay, Carol, if you're ready now, I'm going to turn the lights out, and we're ready to begin. All right, Carol, uh, everything is looking really, really good out here. I want you to continue to relax now. Skip Atwater is using sound and sensory deprivation to alter Carol's state of consciousness. Inside the Monroe Institute's cave-like isolation chamber, she can see nothing, feel nothing. Her only external stimulus comes from tones in her headphones. And that sound is doing something remarkable. The tones in Carol's ears are slightly out of phase, but they can't be equalized by turning her head. As a result, Carol's brain combines the sounds into a third tone, created from the difference between the original tones. This phenomenon is called binaural beating, and it's modifying Carol's brain waves. Our state of consciousness is linked to brain wave activity, which can be measured by electroencephalograph or EEG. Carol's EEG shows strong activity below seven cycles per second, known as theta and delta waves. 
These frequencies are usually associated with dreams and sleep. But Atwater says Cowell's state is better described as body asleep, mind awake. All those bright colors tell us we're getting lots of delta brain waves going on as she moves into her out-of-body experience. The state of allowing your mind to travel away from your body or that has been characterized by some as an out-of-body experience of this consciousness movement is one that's characterized by this slow wave delta. So using the word sleep isn't really appropriate in this case because our minds are not asleep. Our minds are open and awake to experience. All right, Carol, come on back now. Come on back to the booth here in the lab. It's time to be ending the session. You've been gone quite a while now. Come on back. That's better. I can see that you're back now. Very good. Well, welcome back. How was your experience? Oh, wow. Um, I started out from here, sort of floating up through the, the roof of this, through the ceiling, and I went up out through the building, and I was looking at the building from up above. And then it was like I flew over the the whole scenery here up to like a cabin that that's up on the hill and I was looking at the cabin from the outside. And then from there I was out in, in this space. That all of a sudden I felt this being come close to me and couldn't really see it. I could just sort of feel this energy. There is information elsewhere. There is information beyond the limitations of the physical body, beyond the limitations of our five physical senses. And it is our mind that gives us access to those things. It is our very own thoughts. It is the essence of us, the soul of us, that allows us to know these things. Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute was a radio broadcasting executive who became known for his research into altered consciousness using audio patterns containing binaural beats. These audio techniques were designed to stimulate brain functions, causing the left and right hemispheres to become synchronized, which when combined with instruction, similar to hypnotic suggestion, can lead to out-of-body experiences, a term coined by Mr. Monroe after publishing his 1971 book called Journeys Out of the Body. I'd like to play a brief clip of Robert Monroe being interviewed on a talk show in 1979 where he describes certain phenomena in his own words. And the author of this book, Journeys Out of the Body, would you welcome Robert Monroe. <laughs> what is an out of body experience? Well, uh, an out-of-body experience is a state of being, a state of awareness, a state of action, uh, separate and apart from the physical body. Uh, about 25% of the population throughout the world, I guess, uh, has this spontaneously take place that they're aware of uh, at least once in their lifetime. Now, what, what, what happens? Yeah. What happens? Well. What happens is that uh, you, as an individual, uh, suddenly find yourself, for one reason or another, apart from your physical body, and yet you can think, you can be, you can act, but your physical body is in some other location. It may be only two inches away or 2,000 miles away. Now, we've heard about people who have supposedly yeah. died and then have come back to life that is also an out-of-body experience? That is indeed an out-of-body. It's a rather extreme way. Uh, uh, <laughs> you believe in that, then? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if someone's in an awful automobile accident, and the next thing they know, they're kind of floating above it, watching... That's what we mean by a spontaneous one, as it were. And uh, uh, it is very, very common. And also, a very important thing is that everyone does this. The fact that you do not remember it, it does not...
uh, infer that it does not happen. For example, uh, during what we call Delta sleep at night, which everyone goes through, is quite probably, according to our researches, the time when everyone goes into this out-of-body state. You don't remember it, but it does take place. Now, is that like a dream? No, it's something apart from a dream. It is a, uh, there's, we, there's no philosophic uh, connotation in our approach to it, but it is somewhat a process of the recharging mechanism that you get during sleep. Hmm. When you first had yours, were you frightened? I was totally frightened. Uh, Panic-stricken is a better word for it. And uh, I went through, as a result, uh, all the processes of uh, medical examinations, psychiatric examinations, trying to determine why this was happening. Now, can this help people if they learn this out-of-body experience? Can it help them when they die, when, or they think they're going to die, or their time's up in this There's life? There's a major discovery that comes with the result of such activity or practice. Without any equivocation, without any uh, going past hope, belief, uh, uh, faith, you know that you do survive death. This changes your overview, your perspective. You have that knowledge, and it's not a religious thing. It's not a a philosophic thing, it's a very, very pragmatic thing that you do survive physical death. And you also, as it says in your book, can take terminal patients and relieve them of their pain by getting them to this work out of body. This is what we do. We, we let them establish a beachhead where they're going so that they're totally familiar with where they're going and then their fears evaporate completely and they make nice neat plans with some friends of theirs there uh, to have a welcoming party, as it were. So you're not, you're not afraid of dying at all, are you? Well, yes, I don't particularly want to. I have too much to do here, but uh, I'm not afraid of it. I, I would think I would get rather irritated that if I had to die now, I'd be irritated. Is now. it possible, since you've had these out-of-body experiences, you know how you're going to die? Have you seen yourself die yet? <clears throat> yes and no. I, I should give you one illustration that is important to me. Uh, I've passed the 20-year mark in this exploration. And I think that I have done this for two reasons. One, to prove that you can do this and still stay physically alive. And the second is that you can do this and still stay reasonably sane. <laughs> In theosophy, the soul is part of a person which belongs to a formless, non-material, and timeless world and gathers experience through its effort to express itself in the physical world. Afterwards, there is a withdrawal from the physical plane to successively higher levels of reality in death, experiencing a purification and assimilation of the past life. The concept of nourishing the soul to achieve higher spiritual states of consciousness is a central part of mystery schools and secret societies which view themselves as custodians of ancient techniques which have been passed down for many millennia. Many of these practices were outlawed and in some cases punishable by death and went underground and hidden in symbolism, such as the case with the subject of alchemy, which in actuality was not confined to the transmutation of base metals into gold, but in its esoteric form had to do with the development of spiritual gold spirit or soul. Which brings us to Jürgen Ziva, a consciousness researcher and author who has accumulated 40 years of experience with meditation, leading to a wealth of knowledge from experimenting with lucid dreaming and astral travel. His experiences seem to align with those of Robert Monroe and offers some thought-provoking insight into what the afterlife may be like. The first thing I like to say, before we even begin, is there is a perceived notion that, that what we see from this viewpoint, or earthly viewpoint, is a predominant reality, you know, from which everything is judged, really. I think what would be really important if we reversed our thinking and took the opposite viewpoint that everything which is non-physical, is primary, 
and what is physical is secondary. You know, so so what this means is we think we we have all uh, the knowledge that we are living in the ultimate reality, and from our limited viewpoint, we perceive the non-physical world, or let's call it the afterlife, as if it is something that is happening um, in in some distance, you know. But in fact, it's not like that. The reality is that we are a secondary. The primary aspect of reality is actually the non-physical. And it starts off right at the top from where consciousness begins, let's say, if there is such a thing as a beginning, because there isn't really, consciousness is. And everything that plays out plays a secondary role from the primary consciousness. And then it gets down into the billions of types of manifestations on different uh, dimensional levels. And our physical level is only one of many, many other levels. And it's not even that important, really. It's just that we have chosen um, to play a part on this level in order to get a certain set of experiences. But this is not really our real life. You know, this is only a very small part of it. And it only contributes to our much greater life, which uh, we uh, we enter into once we shed this physical body. So that's the first thing I like to say. If we reverse our thinking and not think of ourselves in this physical world as being of primary importance, it is only a small sidestep in, into another dimension which allows us to bring uh, more experience into the field of our unity in, in, into our consciousness, in, into the consciousness, not just of ourselves, but of us as a whole species, and even into the consciousness of the whole universe. So that's what, what I would like to start, uh, where I would like to start. Um, <clears throat> the, the other thing I uh, mentioned earlier, I was talking, we, we normally are concerned very often with people we have known who left this physical earth and that's usually accompanied by a great level of hardship and uh, bereavement and pain and anguish because the feeling is once these people our loved ones our family have gone we we are sort of separated from them that is just another one big illusion which is not actually the truth because the truth is they're still here. We just, our physical senses are not able to perceive them, but they're still around us, they're still here. Now, from their point of view, they have never really left us because what they are um, seeing or can see anytime they choose to, they can see us, but they don't see us, they don't see our physical body, they communicate and see our astral body. Our astral body is basically a counterpart or a copy of our physical body. And, but on the astral level, it expresses itself much more formidably than it does on the physical level. For example, if we have any kind of pain, anguish or anything, then our exterior on the astral level will change accordingly. It does so on the physical level because we look sad and we look down if you are sad or down or joyful, we look younger. Even on the physical level, if you are happy, we look younger. If we are unhappy, we tend to look older. But on the astral level, this is all much more uh, exaggerated. So the people, the, our, our loved ones who are on the astral level, not only do they uh, see us, but they also get the full gist of our feelings. You know, they can tune into it, they, they get it instantaneously. Whereas here on this level, we have to say, okay, you know, you look a bit sad, what's the matter? We have to talk about it. There, we don't have to talk about it because we communicate it and they can see it. They can, they can tap into our thought, into our thoughts and into our being. Now, I mentioned um, in, the, in the introduction that I was going to talk about a stage which is going a little bit beyond of what the normal 
um, you know, the normal aspect of the afterlife is basically people are uh, drawn to us because of our our links we have with them, you know, so, so they're always there, they're always aware of how we're feeling, so they can they can do their best to um, to help us in terms of um, giving us love or, and vice versa. We can also do the same thing because on the astral level, these things are very, very powerful forces. Now, if you take, for example, the Japanese culture, the Japanese are very, very good at sort of worshipping their ancestors. To them, um, death doesn't really exist as it does in the West, you know. So they, they have got a very strong cultural bond to their ancestors because they feel they are still there. When we enter into the state, and just a brief description what it feels like, once the ego identification is gone, you feel you are, let's say the ego identification, our personal identification, if you link it or picture it like a cup, okay, that's where we are, we are inside the cup and, and that's what, what we are. But when we get into the awakening state, we are still the cup, but we are also the thing, the surrounding that holds the cup. So we're no longer limited to this cup and we then transcend the limitations of our physical experience and we broaden our identity and our sense of self into a universal sort of sense. And the first thing that happens is we no longer um, uh, perceive an outside world. You know, before we have seen, okay, this is me and there's a world outside. This is me and there are other people, they're all strangers. This, this uh, concept just falls apart. It doesn't exist anymore because we suddenly become uh, aware of a much greater sense of ourselves. At the same time, we also recognize that uh, the people we meet, you know, we, uh, we don't recognize them as strangers anymore. We are more likely to pick up on their on their inner divinity, you know, even if they're angry, you know, we very often perceive that as a mask or as an irritation or something they, they were temporarily engaged in. But we tend to look a little bit beyond that, you know. I wanted to ask you, have you noticed people who are on the lower levels actually able to transcend consciousness? Uh, and de develop the, those kinds of breakthroughs that you're talking about from the other side, from yeah. their, their normal thing. Yes, people, that is a natural state of progression. What happens on the lower levels, which are called the near earth levels, you know, which are basically exactly like, like this physical world. You wouldn't know the difference if you are on these near earth levels. The thing I noticed some people were sort of plagued by boredom, okay? And when this boredom or dissatisfaction sets in, that is usually the beginning that, there, that there's an awakening for something, for a need, something more. And this sort of attracts other people to them, which are sort of in, in congruence with them, you know, in sympathy with them. So they, they gradually shift their environment, shift their uh, needs the same as we do here you know suddenly we come to a point in our life where we are dissatisfied with our jobs and we want to change the job these needs still persist and then people want to have more the good thing is the opportunity for learning is much much more enhanced you know because also the thing is it's almost like we, we are leaving a straitjacket behind when we come when we slip out of our body. It's almost as if we leave a really heavy garment behind and now for the first time we see our potential. Also because this is really our primary state we are entering into. We're getting out of our exile state and we're entering into our primary home state. And, and that is the other thing. There's an attraction, there's an inner attraction which draws us forward and that is the way I identified it was a feeling of homecoming. 
you know. And, and this, this feeling of homecoming becomes stronger the, the higher our consciousness, the more our consciousness expands. So we feel, um, we feel better as we advance, you know, into higher levels. And Swedenborg talks about angels a lot, but he doesn't regard angels as, as different species from human. He sees angels as human beings who have simply transcended their, limited, their limitations and expanded their consciousness. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that spiritualists often say that people can people incarnate because they can make more progress here than they can in the afterlife. It seems that this is actually um, a mistaken view. No, no. There are certain things. There are certain uh, resistances which we have here, which we don't have there. So, so it's this aspect of resistance which generates a lot of energy, a lot of confrontation, a lot of conflict, you know. It's basically the physical resistance which we seek out if we want to learn particularly hard lessons, you know, which are not so easily learned or understood on the, on the spiritual levels, because everything is more easily accomplishable, you know. We, can be, we have much better access to our uh, our subconscious on the spiritual level. For example, here when we have a problem, we have to really work at it. We have to work it out. We have to see a therapist, you know, to work it out on the astral level. If we have got a, a negative feeling, we can actually see the negative feeling in our environment. For example, we can feel it, you know, and we, we can feel the relationship to it. For example, I had a dream last night, uh, for example, that that the house, the house was uh, the roof was leaking, you know. And in in my dream, I instantly recognized I had a I had a problem with with a political sort of situation our country is going through at the moment, you know. And I felt uh, the house is leaking. There are sort of negative things coming through. But in my dream, I was Im immediately able to make the connection, you know. Um, so we need the physical, or we, we, we have, let's say, we have chosen the physical incarnation simply because it gives us more friction and it gives us more grit and more intensity of learning, you know. So that is a very desirable place for a lot of people to go through. I have a question about on the... Um upper planes the assumption of course is that there's a loss of ego and i appreciate all your past work i'd like to say about the importance of depth psychology of shadow work but given that there is a loss of ego i wonder if you agree that there is there remains individualized purified uh beings um individuals who are soulful and on a high level of inf of evolution who can continue to have community loving interaction with other individuals on the same level and yes. including those we have cherished soulfully and spiritually on this plane yeah first of all i, I make a distinction we still have our ego you know and even in the higher levels you know we still have the ego identification uh, there's only a little shift that we, we, we don't lose our individuality. We don't lose our persona, okay? There's no stage in the expansion of consciousness where we lose anything, okay? The, the way I see it, we gain things. We become more of who we are, not less. So, so uh, Maslow in the 50s called it self-actualization. The more we mature, the more we fulfill our potential, the more we become truly of who we are. Because you have to remember, we spent probably thousands of years in our previous history trying to get to the point where we are now. And this, there's a continuous growth, 
you know. And when we expand our consciousness to the point that we have this sort of, sort of unity awareness, that we re recognize everything uh, has got the same source or the same origin, we still recognize other people as who they are you know, our parents, and they, and they can be in a very, very high state of consciousness. They become more like they are, you know, but based on a level of love, the love aspect is a predominant aspect of their humanity. And this love aspect makes them who they really are, who they truly are. The other things which we uh, sort of didn't like so much, they were usually the attribute of their ego. That falls away because the conflict no longer exists, we become more harmonized in our true self because it's love driven, or compassion driven. And so we are, we are on an expansive tra trajectory. The higher our consciousness rises, the more we unfold, the more we learn, the more we become who we really are. The astral world is a plane of existence postulated by esoteric philosophies and mystery schools in which we all allegedly maintain an aspect of our greater non-physical consciousness that most people seem to be largely unaware of while living out their physical lives, but is as real, if not more so, than this material earth plane. Parama Hansa Yogananda wrote in Autobiography of a Yogi, quote, the astral universe is hundreds of times larger than the material universe, with many astral planets teeming with astral beings. Plato and Aristotle taught that the seven planetary bodies, which they refer to as celestial gods, were composed of a fifth element, or quintessence, that was reflected in the soul of man, thus accounting for the influence of the stars upon human affairs. As above, so below. Similar concepts are common in Theosophy, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Zoroastrianism, and Mithraic sects, which subscribe to seven initiatory stages, which are the same number of dream gates described by Carlos Castaneda. Even Islam shares this astral view, as the Quran references the Prophet Muhammad's ascent through seven heavens. Throughout the Renaissance, Philosophers, Rosicrucians, and alchemists continue to discuss the nature of the astral world, intermediate between Earth and the divine, which was eventually abolished with the invention of the telescope that established no spiritual heaven was visible around the solar system, so the idea was suspended in mainstream science as the pendulum swung in the direction of materialism. But just maybe the pendulum of science swung a bit too far. While I know most of you follow me because of my work in anthropology and history, I think it's important to also highlight the spiritual aspects of our existence because ultimately we're all spiritual beings regardless of our political or religious affiliation. On a personal level, this reality hit home for me recently as I lost my father to cancer and I wanted to reach out to some of you that may also be going through a loss to let you know that you're not alone there is more to our eternal existence than this one life and to remind you that there's a bigger picture to focus on and a brighter future to look forward to. That said, I'm now looking forward to a good meal because while I'm still occupying this body, I want to make sure to savor life's simple pleasures. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.